I'm reading today from Matthew chapter 16. I'll read a handful of verses to start our look into the word of the Lord today. Matthew chapter 16, starting at verse 24. And as a point of reference, I'm reading from the New King James Version. And Matthew says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whosoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. And that is our launching scripture today for what I want to talk to you about. A reward in our type of speaking usually is something we give to somebody for accomplishing something that is great. A challenge that they have overcome. Uh, we, we give people diplomas because they graduate from high schools. We give them degrees because they graduate from college. We give them trophies because they win a championship or not. Uh, in today's world, you can get a trophy for or not. And we look at things. Uh, to us, a reward may mean means something perhaps that is not exactly what is inferred or meaning in the Word of God. When we look at the original Greek and Hebrew of the New and the Old Testament, when the word is used, it usually speaks of something more simpler or something that perhaps takes the shine off of it. It basically means a, a wage. You're paid a wage. You're giving a gift. It is the consequence of, of your actions. Uh, I, I've, I've been, uh, I was exposed here recently. I'm actually reading a book right now by a rabbi called Thou Shalt Prosper. And some of you may have heard of it. Dave Ramsey has recommended it. He's a good friend of the writer, and uh, he gives the Jewish perspective on um, money and how they look at things. And uh, he has a phrase that he likes to use when it comes to capitalism. And he said, if you serve people well, they will reward you with certificates of appreciation with president's heads on them. Okay, think about that for just a moment. Actually, there are some certificates of appreciation that don't have presidents on them, Alexander Hamilton being one of those. But at any rate, a, a reward in biblical means to be paid a, a, a wage or to be honored to receive what you have irked, worked or earned for. It is, in, in another way of looking at it, it is a payment for faithfulness. In Hebrews chapter 11 and 6, a verse that you probably can already quote with me says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder. God is a rewarder. He gives back to people what they deserve or what they have accomplished or what they have done. Now, we believe that we are saved by grace through faith. We believe that. This is not a disclaimer. That's an established fact. We cannot violate that truth. I am here today because of no good works that I have done. And I am here today because I have not been prohibited from any bad works that I have done. I am saved by grace through faith. That is a gift of God. I did not earn it. I do not deserve it. And I still have it today. It wasn't a one-time thing that happened at conversion. It is grace every single day that keeps me. I don't have a right to be here. By here, I mean walking and breathing and eating and enjoying God's creation. I don't have a right to it. I'm not entitled. And then secondly, I don't have a right to even be with God's people today. I don't have a right to be in God's presence today. And I certainly am far removed from having the right 
to be able to speak to God's people about what's in God's Word. But the grace of God is upon me and upon you today. However, once grace is experienced, there is a result of that, and there is a response to that. If we were to say that good works had no meaning, even after grace, then we would fall into the trap that Paul teaches about when he says, Shall, if, sin, if grace abounds where sin doth abound, then we should continue sinning, and the answer is, God forbid. How, how can it be? We are dead to sin. If works have no place because we are saved by grace, then we would have to go into the book of James and, and Peter and John and other places where in the one place he talks about how that good works adorn the gospel. So our works are not the basis of our salvation, but our works will always have a consequence, whether they are evil or whether they are bad. I'm sorry, I'm a little sidetracked today, but uh, I, <laughs> I, I heard somebody on the radio the other day, and he, um, he said to his granddaughter, he said, um, where's your cousin? And uh, she said, oh, he's, he's inside the house with his dad. I said, oh, what's he, uh, what's he doing um, inside the house with his dad? <laughs> says he's experiencing consequences. <laughs> and the person said his granddaughter was just way too articulate and too smart. Her cousin was experiencing consequences. And um, the grandfather said he was so glad that his parents knew how to teach their children how to experience consequences. So you may be experiencing consequences this morning. I have multiple times in my life experienced consequences. They are unavoidable. But, he, but when we look here, he that comes to God must believe he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I am saved by grace, but works are important because if I am a hearer of the word, then I should be a doer of the word. And faith without works is dead, being alone, James says. So the writer of Hebrews emphasizes the fact that God is a rewarder. He blesses and he benefits those who diligently seek him. Genesis chapter 15 expresses it even greater. Not only is he a rewarder, he is the reward. For he says to Abraham, After these things the word of the Lord came to Abraham, Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. At a time in Abram's life when Lot left him because of the conflict between their herdsmen, when he was all alone, when he now is by himself, the Lord appears to him and says to him, I'm your shield and I am your exceeding great reward. Not only is God a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, he himself is the reward. And that is a great thing. So in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 12, when Jesus is teaching on the Mount of Olives, and we call it the Sermon on the Mount, and he gives them, again, the Beatitudes, he says to them, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Notice in this verse, it's not a reward on earth, but a reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. God is a rewarder, and he rewards us, sometimes here and sometimes there. But for me, especially in my spiritual immaturity, heaven would have been enough. But to think I'm going to get to heaven and I can have a reward. No, back that up. A great reward in heaven is something that goes beyond what I can humanly comprehend. But so it is written, and so it is said, and so it will be. There is a great reward for those of us who live by the Word of God, and a great reward reserved for us in heaven. But I want to spend the remainder of our time this morning, particularly in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 
and uh, starting at verse number 9. And this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth that we, we know by the writing that they are considered a carnal church. They are selfish. They are self-centered. They are cliquish. Uh, they have their own little groups and their own little self-centeredness. And they are dividing themselves. I mean, one group is in this corner, one group is in that corner, because this group over here, they like Brother Ed's preaching, and this group over here, they like Pastor Jason's preaching, and some of them, they don't like anybody's preaching until Paul shows up. So there was, there was, you know, there was partiality and prejudice and preference among them. And Paul chastises them for their spiritual immaturity, although he calls it carnal. He said, you're, you're carnal, you're soulish. You look at everything through a selfish lens. And so you have all of these issues going on. And after he starts to address, I mean, the whole, the whole book deals with certain symptoms of their condition. But in verse number 9 of 1 Corinthians 3, he, he begins to speak to them to bring their minds into what they're really about. And he begins by saying, we are God's fellow workers. Now, as a point of order in this verse, anytime there is a pronoun, and that's what the word we is, and then he says, you are God's field, God's building. When there is a pronoun in Scripture, you need to make absolutely sure you understand who the pronoun is. Because most people will read this verse and it says, for we are God's fellow workers and think that it's including us. Oh, well, it isn't. Well, let's talk about that for a moment. Many times in the scriptures when Paul uses the word we in the epistles, he's not speaking of the congregation or the believers. He is speaking of those who are in leadership. In those days, they would have called it apostolic leadership. Paul was an apostle. Barnabas is never called an apostle, but the work that he did was one of an apostle. And Timothy and some of these others, when he would refer to the we there, he is referring back to the ministry, the leadership, Apollos, Cephas, others that he mentions. He said, for we are God's fellow workers. All right, so now that we understand that from a grammar point of view, does that mean that you and I are not fellow workers with God? No, it doesn't deny that. But we need to understand, first of all, that the we, the pronoun we in this sentence is not referring to us in general. It is referring primarily to the leadership and to the Apostle Paul. He said, we are God's fellow workers. And he said, and you are God's field. You are God's building. I hate to tell you this, and please don't get offended with me when I call this, but you're just, you, you are God's farmland. Boy, that makes me feel really glorious, right? I want to go to a church where they tell me my divine purpose and my eternal destiny. And Oh, we'll talk about all of that. I have no problem with that. But we're just farmland. You know what we are? We're just dirt. And God plows us and he plants us and he pulls out weeds and he, he prunes us. He's our husbandman or the vine keeper, so to speak. You are God's field. Well, that's glamorous, isn't it? No, it's not glamorous but it'll bring us to a point of understanding. And you are God's building. Sure we are. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Who's building it? The pastor? No, the pastor's not building it. The ministry? No, we're not building it. God's building the church, and it belongs to him. He said, you are God's building. He continues by saying, according to the grace of God which was given to me, a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation and another builds on it, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. Paul and his apostolic calling is explaining to them that he has built a foundation that is in a figurative spiritual sense. He said, I've given you the foundation. Jesus said that if you hear my words and do them, you're like a man who's built his house upon a rock. But if you hear my words and don't do them, you're like a man who's built your house 
upon the sand. Notice, he's not talking about people who never hear him. If you hear him and you don't do it, then you're like a man who builds on the sand. But if you hear and do, you're like a man who builds on the rock. Well, what about the people who don't hear? They're not in the story. They're not even building at all. They're not even building on sand. They're accomplishing nothing. They're getting nowhere. But it would be a shame for us to live for God 30, 40, 50 years and enjoy the preaching and get, and get excited about the things of God but never do them and one day realize that our life or our house has been built on a foundation of sand. And that, that will always be proven through time because the house built on sand does not withstand the winds and the storm and all the elements that may come against it. Paul said, I have laid the foundation. The members of Corinth didn't lay a foundation. You don't lay a foundation yourself. The foundation to us believers has already been laid. It has been laid by the apostles and the prophets. One place Paul said, you're built upon a foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Jesus said, Peter, flesh and blood have not revealed to you that I'm the Messiah, but my Father which is in heaven, I say unto you that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The rock that he's referring to is the understanding of the deity of Christ, that Jesus Christ is God. If you take deity out of Christ, you have zero. You have nothing. You have a man. You have a prophet. You have whatever good you want to call him, but he has no divine authority. But Jesus, being God, said, I'll build my church upon a rock, and that's the solid foundation. So the church is built upon the rock, but Paul, as an apostle, had to establish that in their hearts and in their minds. And he said, I have laid the foundation. Notice we said, no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. The church is built upon Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ, his teachings, his doctrine, his life, his righteousness, everything that encompasses him, we are built upon that. If we're not built upon that, then we are built upon nothing. If this church is built upon activities, if this church is built on generous acts, if this church is built upon uh, a promotion to achieve a certain number, or if this church is built upon the premise of entertainment and making people feel good, then the church will not stand. Everything that we do, and our music goes with it, our praise goes with it, our generous works goes with it, but everything has to be tied back to Jesus Christ and what he is and who he is and how he would have us to be. He is the head of the church. And without him, we can do nothing. He said, he said, no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid. There is no other foundation. You can call it one, but that doesn't make it one. And we certainly see that in our society. We call things things that aren't things. We call, we call uh, same-sex unions marriages. And it's not a marriage. Maybe legally, maybe in man's lot world. But it's not a marriage. God didn't define a marriage like that. God defines what things are. So you can build upon a foundation all that you want, but if it's not Christ, it's not a foundation, and it will not stand. Now, if anyone builds, he said, on this foundation, so he's established the fact that I have set the foundation. Now, I'm a builder by trade, so I understand that. There's different types of foundations. The most important thing is that the foundation is put upon ground that don't move. <laughs> and in the notes of every plans I've discovered so far, it'll say it has to be on soil that is compacted, at least 85% of this and that and all kinds of scientific terms, and you have to do all of those kind of things. You're going to put weight on something, you better have a 16-inch or a footer. If you're going to put more weight, you better have a 24 by 24. And if you're, going to, if you're going to put more weight than that, you better put pilings down and hit something solid because it's, it's going to fail. It's going to fail. And so this foundation is laid. And he says, but now it is your responsibility to build on it. And here's, here's a fact. You're building on, if you're a child of God 
and you profess Christ and you're living for Christ, you're building on that foundation even if you think you're not. Even omission is a form of building. And someday it'll be tested. We're going to find that out here in a moment. Look what he says. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw. I don't know why he picked those six materials. I'm sure there could have been more, but these are the ones he picked. Perhaps he is familiar with those because of the type of construction they had in those days, because this would have been the thing. I mean, the three little pigs figured that out, didn't they? And so here he says, if anyone builds on this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw. So here's what you get to build out of. You can use gold. You can use silver. Precious stones. little explanation in order on precious stones. He's not talking about sapphires, rubies, jasper, jade, all those, those, we would consider those precious stones in the jewelry world. But this, this particular phrase, he is referring to things like granite, marble, stuff that could be quarried, that can be mined. I, uh, that's another part of my trade that uh, I get to experience because now, you know, we used to have in the old days, everybody wanted solid surface countertops. They were a s synthetic kind of thing, and it was all the rage. And then they came out with granite. Granite is an actual stone, and they get it from different places in the world, and they would polish it, and you had to sanitize it ever so often because it has pores in it, the natural stone. And then somebody said, well, <clears throat> we're going to make quartz, and uh, quartz is a man-made product, and it, you don't have to stare. It's, it has no pores, and it looks nice, but it doesn't have all the natural veining and look in it. And so then they came up with quartzite, and now we have all kinds of blends and mixtures, and it's, it's some fascinating material. But it comes from all over the world. We, um, we were going to remodel uh, our master bath several years ago. We went to a, a local place because I knew I wanted stone. Uh, believe it or not, and I'm digressing for a moment, but when you get tile, you buy tile, it's man-made. It may be porcelain, ceramic, whatever. But if you look really close and you pull out five or six, seven different pieces of tile and lay them out, you'll start seeing a pattern in them because they're stamped out. They're made. And so it may be one every ten or one every eight. Sometimes it's one every four. There's a pattern to it. So when I'm in people's houses, I'm looking, instantly my eye will catch the pattern. And it can look really, really good, and it's the right product at times. But when you get stone, it never has a pattern. Every piece has a variation in color and in veining, like a piece of wood. And uh, it, it, just, it can be beautiful because of its irregularity. And so we, we picked out a marble that was called Ephesus marble. It was a real whitish, uh, it, it, it was very soft. It wasn't like a gray white, and we liked it. And uh, my installer started to put it on, and every time he'd put it on and go to shift it and move it, it was so fragile it would break because it was a natural product. And when it all came down to it, we had to go and select another different kind that was a little stronger. You never know what you're going to get sometimes, but there is a beauty of it, and there's a, uh, uh, it's, it's God's beauty. It's not a man-made beauty, and you can build things out of this. So I see in my work a lot of natural stone products because people like that type of thing and he's saying that if you are a child of God and you're going to build on the foundation of Christ in your life that's that foundation that's been laid by the ministry that has brought you to the knowledge of the truth you can build it out of beautiful things or you can build it out of the cheap things you can go to the easy stuff everything he listed here the gold the silver and the precious stones you will not find it laying on the ground if you're going to get gold let's say you don't have a jeweler we're not living in those days you're in his day you want gold? You got to go find it somewhere. And then you got to dig it up. And then you got to process it, perhaps refine it, shape it, silver the same, granite, marble. It has to be chiseled. It has to be polished. It, it is a product that needs to be shaped 
and form. It has to be mined. It has to be gotten out of a quarry. But if you're going to build out of wood, hay, or straw, you normally can get that pretty easily. Of the three, wood may be the most difficult because you would have to cut down a tree. Oh, I'm sorry, murder a tree. <laughs> cut down a tree and then cut it, sand it, and use it. But that wood that looks so beautiful, matter of fact, if you look at the crown molding in here, that's all natural, solid wood. There is no grain in it alike anywhere. It's all different. The problem with that is if there's a fire in here, that beautiful wood becomes nothing more than fuel. If there's a fire and it's built out of gold and silver or granite or marble, it may char it, but it will stand. It will last. You can choose to build your life out of different materials once you come to know the Lord. It's your choice. And I got something else that I'm gonna, may shock you. It's not a heaven or hell issue. This has always been a, a scary subject. When, I mean, many years ago when, when, this was, when I started studying this and certain ministry would start to deal with it, there was such a stigma in at least the churches that I attended that everything, should I do this? Will it help me go to heaven or will it send me to hell? Is it a heaven or hell issue? And so we would read stuff like this and it would say, uh, you're, going, you're going to suffer fire, is going to test your works, but you can still be saved. And preachers, some of the preachers I knew at the time were like, well, we can't tell people that. We don't, we don't want people to to feel like they can just do anything or do the little bit and get by and, and be saved. And that's really not what Paul is saying here at all. He is saying, though, that as a child of God, you have the choice how you're going to build your life. It's a matter of reward. It's not a matter of salvation. He's not talking about sin here. He's not talking about rebellion. He's not talking about, uh, you know, being stubborn and not doing what God says. He's talking about what are you doing now that you're saved to build your life? Are you going to build it out of stuff that lasts, stuff that can be tested with fire, or will you build the cheap, simple stuff that takes no effort, no discipline, and you're just going to bring it into the picture? Let me read a few more verses here, and then I want to elaborate on that for just a moment. He said in verse 13, that each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he shall receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as by fire that's the verse that scared a lot of ministry when i was a young man because no way in the world did they want to tell people that people to get the wrong idea that oh if i live for god and i don't build a good structure on it i could still be saved obviously that seems to say eh, it don't really matter choose what you want to do if you do you're good if you don't you're good and that's not what paul is talking at all here because here's the thing You may get to heaven and have no reward. That may, that may be the way that it works. But you don't want to get to heaven and have no reward. Seriously, folks. God has called you out of a world of sin, a world of chaos. He's given you His glorious light. He's put His Spirit down inside your heart. He's given you righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And you just take that for granted and say, uh, I won't take how I build my life very seriously. So we talked about those things. So what's Paul talking about here? Well, where is this gold and silver? What is it talking about? Once we come to the knowledge of Christ, we choose whether we're going to build our lives upon that which is spiritual or that which is carnal. Let me read a few things to you. We won't be much longer here this morning. Matthew chapter 5 and 2. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corner of the streets, that they may be seen by men. 
Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Verse 5. Or no, let me go back to verse 2. When, therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Now, <laughs> just think about this for a minute. Jesus said that when you do a charitable thing, don't put a trumpet to your mouth and blow it so that everybody knows, hey, I'm giving to the hungry today. I think that's funny that people would even do it. And yet Jesus said, that's exactly what they do. And they thought it was spiritual. They thought that was religious. They thought that proved they had a special relationship with God. And we're laughing about it today. In verse 16, he said, moreover, when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites with a sound, sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to be fasting. <laughs> Boy, these Pharisees are really working hard at trying to convince everybody of how spiritual and righteous they are. It, I mean, that's a lot of hard work. You know? It's bad enough to fast, let alone disfigure your face just so everybody knows you're fasting. He said, Assuredly, I say unto you, they have their reward. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, if you fast and you don't do it before men. God sees it. He'll take care of it, and you don't have to tell nobody. It's not a, he, he rewards better than that. If you fast or you give or you pray so that men may see you, and they do see you, that's all the reward you get. You get it, and it's gone. You get it, and it's over. How shallow can you be? I put that in there. How shallow can you be that you would live your life Always trying to be concerned about what people think of you? And he said, if that's the way you're going to build your life, then that's the only reward you're going to get. I'll tell you what, this danger of pursuing honor from men is a really dangerous thing. I don't think we realize how dangerous it is. For that, I direct you to John chapter 5 and verse 44. Listen to what Jesus, what Jesus said about this attitude. How can ye believe? which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only. Let's slow down a moment. He said, how can you believe if you seek the honor that comes from men and not from God? Now, unless I'm missing something and you want to come to me afterwards, which I would be, wouldn't be embarrassed by at all, but... I think I'm a pretty good understanding of grammar in English. He's saying that if your attitude or your perspective of life is to seek honor and prestige from men, it blinds you spiritually to being able to even believe on him. You mean my desire to be liked or to be recognized or receive applause and limelight? Yes, it can be so dangerous that it will block you from looking and believing on him Matthew 6 again take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them otherwise you have no no reward from your Father in heaven. In other words, <laughs> you may experience consequences. You have no reward in heaven. So the most philanthropist person, the most giving, the most generous person, if they do it in the wrong way and for the wrong reason, may get zero. No wonder Paul said, if I, if I have not love, I become like tinkling brass and sounding cymbal. If I give my body to be burned, he said, without love, it's all meaningless because I haven't built on the right thing. So we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He said, you can, build, you can build your life on what? You can build it with gold, silver, and precious stones, which means you built it on the things that come from a spiritual mind. 
that says everything that I do is for Christ. Or you can be the cheap Christian that likes to tell everybody you're a believer because you go to church and how great your church is and you give to the poor and you participate in this and you participate in that. You can build it out of the, the cheap stuff, the easy stuff, the stuff that comes natural to the flesh, the come, stuff that comes natural out of pride. Or you can live the life that means, yes, I need some discipline and yes, I need to seek God for my choices and my decisions and I need to make sure because I want to build a structure. I'm not building on the wrong foundation. That's not even the question, but I'm building and I want it to be able to stand the test of fire. Every believer's work will be tested by fire. I didn't say that. The Scripture said that. John stood before Jesus in Revelation chapter 1 and said his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. That's not the only place in Scripture where it speaks of his eyes being a flame of fire. Is that the fire that will burn? I can't say for sure, but I know there will be a fire that tests my works. And whether I've lived for God five years or 50 years, I'm building something with something. Perhaps I got a little bit of everything mixed in there. I don't know. Matter of fact, I don't even know if I'm a good evaluator of what's there I try I look at my life I know that you do what have I built what have I become what have I allowed God to make me some of that I won't know until the very end and some of that he shows me today because he wants me to change now but I don't really know in the scheme of things whether I am the ultimate ability to evaluate but I know there is an eternal fire that will evaluate it to consume me no to destroy me no God got over his anger at me at the cross. God took out all his anger on Christ because that was the anger he had directed towards me. It, that, that part's over now. I have a foundation, but what I have is a life to build. And that, when that day comes, I want him to say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, which he will to all believers. But I want to be able to say, Whatever you give me as a reward, Lord, I have the ability, the desire to offer it back to you because without him, I could have done nothing to begin with. So the question is asked, what, what, why would you preach something like that today? Because I want to know, do you want a reward? I don't even want to know the answer. <laughs> I'm not going to grade that test. That question, that's not, you know, we're not going to turn this pop quiz back into me. I'm not grading it. But when you go leave this place today and somewhere come Tuesday afternoon or Wednesday morning or Thursday when things aren't going so well and you're faced with a situation and you don't know what to do with it and you say, well, I think I'll just do this, maybe perhaps we ought to say, oh, wait a minute, I think me and the Lord will have a conversation about that because I want to build something. I want to build something that I know will stand the fire. I... Um, I don't know what it is about my particular line of work, but I, my brother laughs at me because it seems like a, many of the customers that I get, they, they love to change things all the time. I had a situation. We had the whole house almost completely done, and the owner says to me, he says, well, can we add these certain lights here? I guess he thought, you, you know, mo most people I work with don't understand the sequence of construction. So they, 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 they want to tell me all about the paint colors when we haven't even laid the foundation. Or they want to tell me, uh, or they want to change light fixtures or do certain things once we've got everything all closed up and the drywall's on. And I said, you know, we can, we can do that if you want, but we're going to have to tear out everything that we've already done. You got to go back. You're going to pay double for it. You know, I, I hate to say this, but there's been a few times in my life I've had to go back and rework some things because I didn't use the right material. But it would be far better that you rework it now than to have it burn up in the fire. And so, you know, while I got time, I can, I can correct it. I can't rewind it. I can't go back. I can't retract my words. I can't reverse my decisions. But perhaps... The grace of God will help me to do the things I can do to go forward from here. And so we live in a wonderful time where the grace of God is working abundantly in our lives. I want to have a reward. I don't want to run this race 
just to get across the finish line. I want to run this race so I can get the reward. I'm not running it for the reward. But if I'm going to run it, I might as well run well. So run, Paul said, that you might obtain. May God bless you today. Let's stand together. So it's, it's, it's all up to us. I mean, it's not even up to my wife how I build my life. And her life's not up to me. <laughs> and all the married people say, thank you, Lord. <laughs> it wasn't up to my parents. No. And it's not, not up to my children. But it's up, it's up to me to say, God, I thank you that you've brought me into your marvelous light. Now let me build according to your power that works in me. I want to do that, and I know you do as well.